Now I'll be honest, I usually kick off these reviews with a dig at the venue we're racing at, but when it comes to mid-Ohio, I literally know nothing about it. So I gave it a Google then, and the top result described the place as, quote, almost heaven. I guess that's why Pagano tried to make the trip early. Hey there guys, I'm Will, welcome to FP1 and the comedy review as IndyCar headed to mid-Ohio for the ninth round of the season. We're at the halfway point in the year now, a year that frankly has been dominated by Alex Pillow and Ganassi. You could say IndyCar and F1 mirror themselves a lot nowadays, except we haven't got bored of the once great team looking like imbeciles yet, and the fact that unlike Formula 1, IndyCar is actually good. Just like Simon Pagano, there's plenty to sink our nose cones into today. So let's get into the comedy review of the Honda Indy 2000 at Mid-Ohio presented by the 2023 Accord Hybrid Grand Prix. News time then, and first off we have to revisit Colton Herter, who's finally decided that he wants to be quick again, it's just that his strategists haven't quite woken up yet. Following the last race at Road America, Andretti Autosport decided to make further reshuffles in that exact department. As a result, Herter would see his third strategist on the year, in the form of Devlin Di Francesco's usual race caller, Rob Edwards probably because there's not much use Devlin having one. There were further personnel changes down the grid, as McLaren announced the signing of IndyCar legend Tony Kanaan as a new advisor, and nobody seemed to care. We'll get into practice then, the first of which saw absolutely nothing happen, so I'll tell you that Pato Award topped it to move on to what you actually want my thoughts on. Practice 2, and Simon Pagano decided it was time to trade in IndyCar for gymnastics. Now I get the French have been a little bit angry recently, but there's a time and a place, Simon. The crash saw Pagano withdraw from the rest of the weekend, leaving Meyer Shank Racing with a seat free for the race on Sunday. If only there was a recently sacked IndyCar driver floating around the paddock. Oh look, it's Connor Daly. The fan favorite American was back in an IndyCar, though due to the lateness of his entry, didn't have time to qualify. That's okay though, I think he's quite used to starting at the back anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry. We may as well talk about quali, and having been a front runner in practice, Pato Award seemed like a strong candidate for pole. He goes around! Never mind. With Pato and later McLaren teammate Alexander Rossi failing to make it through round one, some of the drivers further down the grid were beginning to poke their heads up in interest. That definitely applied to the Ray Hall Lesman Lanigan cars, in particular Graham Ray Hall. The American grew up around mid Ohio and looked set to take a shock pole at the end of qualifying only to be pipped by Colton in the dying seconds, though now it's just a case of waiting till his strategists fill up his car with vodka or something. In all seriousness though, with Colton's new strategy team already flexing their muscles, could this just be redemption for their mistakes at Road America? We'll come back to that, shall we? Let's instead dive into the race then. Herta making a great start, Ross Ray Hall came back to his senses and decided it was time to be slow again. With the field now checked up, it was time to sit back, relax and wait for the inevitable accident. And this time it would be the pair of Swedes coming to blows, Marcus Ericsson pole vaulting Felix Rosenquist. With Rosenquist's McLaren trying out blackface and the AMR safety crew sending Ericsson on his way with broken suspension, everyone else was gearing up for a restart, where it appeared as if Graham Rahal had actually woken up as he began challenging for the lead. Another driver having a much better weekend was Kyle Kirkwood, until he met Alex Palou, that was. On the bright side, at least Andretti still had a car in the lead. Then again, they also did at Road America, and look how that turned out. Well, Herter would pit on lap 28, leaving Ray Hall to cruise around the front, looking for his retirement home. Now I say that, it was surprisingly close when Graham pitted one lap later. Though, with the aid of warm tyres, Herter was able to move on by. That seemed to imply, though, that the overcut was a viable strategy. And that's exactly what Alex Palou decided to do jumping both Herter and Ray Hall when he emerged from pit road on lap 30. Now before you switch off, assuming Alex will cruise to a sure victory, let's just remember that this is an 80 lap race, and that Herter is very much still in this fight if he doesn't mess up on strategy like he did at Road America. Have you sensed the sarcasm yet? In fact, strategy would have nothing to do with Colton's most recent downfall. This time, the only blame can be appointed to himself. As the American dived into the pits for a second time, he found himself breaking the speed limit. Now, unlike Formula 1, IndyCar tend to award their penalties a bit quicker than four hours after the bloody race. As a result, Colton received a drive through wrecking any chances of victory. All eyes then turned to Graham Rahal. Maybe he could turn his fortunes around with a historic win on home soil. 
or maybe his pit crew would suddenly suffer from dementia instead. With Pelot now uncontested for the victory, there was still some drama further back, mainly with Roman Grosjean and Devlin Di Francesco, who miraculously hadn't crashed yet. That's not like they weren't trying to, however, as the pair dies for P12 like it was a world championship in the closing stages. It was a remarkably quiet and clean race for IndyCar standards. I've not even had to mention Stingray Rob's name all day. Benjamin Peterson, on the other hand, yeah, let's get to that. The Danish driver, yes, I got that right this week, woke up on Sunday and decided he was going to be an asshole for the afternoon. He found himself in his typical position of being lapped by drivers who are actually competent, except chose that he didn't want this to happen. Now, to be clear on the IndyCar rules, we don't see blue flags like we do in Formula 1. Well, not unless they've been lapped once already anyway. Peterson was still on the lead lap, so could technically defend all he liked, though this is one of those unwritten rules between drivers that you, well, just don't. Clearly though, someone had kidnapped Benjamin's entire family and threatened to shoot them periodically in the head every time he let a car through. This continued through the latter stages of the race, though it never impacted Alex Pelot the Ganassi driver coming to the flag to take his fourth victory in five races and extend his championship lead into triple digits. Meanwhile, Scotty Mack went over to have a very polite word with Peterson. Besides his antics, the drivers seemed like they were a little better behaved out there this time round, though we still got plenty of action and some great battling throughout the race. Quite frankly, mid-Ohio was exactly that. Mid but that's just a testament to how great the rest of the season has been so far. Now, I know it was a bit of a shorter one this week, but I really hope you enjoyed the comedy review regardless. So don't forget to drop it a like if you did, and get subscribed for more in the future. I'm trying to get a video out to you guys every single Sunday this year, so be sure to get subscribed so you don't miss out on a single upload. A final thanks, of course, goes to all my patrons and channel members, and if you'd like to get involved in any of that, then you can do so by heading down to the links in the description below. Anyway, for now, that's all from me, so I'll be back very soon for another video, but until then, have a good one.